Hello, Mage fans, and welcome to Reality Deviants Book Club. This is the show where those of us who have negotiated a, uh, let's say, unique relationship with reality discuss entries from the recommended reading list in Mage Books. I'm your host, Adam. I'm joined by co-host Puka. If you're looking for thoughtful, intelligent discussion of books recommended by Mage authors, you should probably keep looking. But if you want to hear us talk about a book, you've come to the right place. We will try to remain coherent for you for the whole recording, but honestly, folks, they don't call us reality deviants for marketing purposes. If you want controversy and spicy takes, we have an ample supply. Before we kick this off, I've been asked to share a statement from our legal team. Opinions expressed on Reality Deviants Book Club really do not express the views of Mage the Podcast. In fact, you probably shouldn't listen to these guys at all. Okay, thank you, legal team. Our listeners probably know who I am, but Puka may be a new name. Puka is an executive producer of Mage the Podcast and a fellow Mage fan. Puka, how did you get started with Mage? Oh, that is a tale long in the telling, so I'll do my best to abridge. I've been gaming since I was very small, but my gateway World of Darkness gaming was Vampire the Masquerade in my early teens, and pretty quickly after that discovered Mage 2nd Edition, but very shortly after that, Mage Revised dropped, and that was when I truly fell in love with the game, because I admit I'm kind of a fan of the street-level gritty stuff that people seem to often hate Revised for, but that remains my favorite edition, and, you know, I've played and run games ever since, so off and on. Well, great. Uh, now, I have heard through the grapevine that you are also involved with a podcast for World of Darkness Games. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, that grapevine just never shuts up. Yes, so I am a co-host of Changeling the Podcast, which is sort of done in the mold of both Mage the Podcast and Werewolf the Podcast, along with Josh Hillerup. Uh, we're now in our second season, going through the second edition of the game, because as much as I love Mage, Changeling does indeed edge it out just slightly. But it's like picking your favorite child, you know? I think I do know the feeling. And uh, was there anything you'd like to tell us about what you do during the day to pay the bills? Well, I work in project management and teach liberal arts to university students on the side as one of the ever-growing adjunct class in the U.S. At night, I fight crimes against fashion. So, Well, I... <laughs> okay. I got Puka on the show to make me look good, but this may work the other way around. Before we started recording, I got some concerned emails from executive producers for Made the Podcast. Uh, let me say no... Uh, funds from executive producers were used for Reality Deviance Book Club, not a dime. As this is the first of what I hope will become a series, I wanted to explain why I chose to discuss selections from recommended reading lists in mage books. Recommended reading lists in RPG books have proven very useful to me. When done well, they give you great examples of what the game designers were thinking of when they put the game together. This helps you not only understand why they wrote the rules the way they did, but it helps you generate content to offer your players. What opened my eyes to this was my experience with Teenagers from Outer Space by R. Talsorian Games. This comedy role-playing game is 126 pages with no supplements. I found out years later there was one published adventure, but I, to this day I've never seen it. My friends and I played the hell out of that game. We had such a great time, we wrote more material for it, extended the rules, everything. I talked to other friends and RPG fans who bought the game, and they had a different experience. They tried a few game sessions and then gave up. They moved on to other games. They told me they didn't know what to do with it, or they couldn't figure it out. I was perplexed, but later found out what happened. The game's designer had watched a lot of episodes of Urusa Yatsura, a Japanese animated comedy show, and decided to make it into a role-playing game. My three friends and I had seen the show, plus other shows from the same animation studio, before we picked up the game. We had even read the manga the shows were based on. We knew the inspirational material well, so when we started the game, we knew exactly what to do with it. NPCs, adventure ideas, stuff the author didn't explain well, it was no problem. Once I figured this out, I tested it on Dungeons and Dragons. The famous Appendix N list of recommended reading by Gary Gygax made D&D click for me. No more scratching my head on obscure rules from early editions. I've been a Mage fan since the game started in 1993, but can I gain any deeper insights by reading the books the Mage writers read? If English people can go searching for the soul of England, can I do the same with Mage? I aim to find out. This may lead me deeper into quiet, but that's kind of my thing anyway, so no problem there. Puka, what are your thoughts on digging into the mage recommended reading lists? I think I have to distinguish between the mage recommended reading lists and recommended reading lists in principle. And for the latter, I mean, I do believe in them because, among other things, I teach media studies from time to time. And I do think that being exposed to the same ideas across different forms of media, in which I include role-playing games, helps people grasp them better because the more permutations you encounter, the more thoroughly you understand all of them. 
with text in particular, and here I want to focus on the reading part of the reading list rather than we get recommended movie lists elsewhere and things like that. With text, you have a lot of agency in how you choose to consume them. You can bounce around and linger on particularly rich passages, reread as you need to. And for something like Mage, which can sometimes get too cerebral for its own good, you might come across a concept or situation that intrigues you, but you're not sure how to build a plot around it or add depth to the characters who populate it. So seeing how it unfolds in another kind of storytelling medium can help both players and storytellers conceptualize it. But that being said, <laughs> everyone's going to have different ideas about the texts that best illuminate the game's themes and ideas, so no reading list should be thought of as absolute. All of them are as personal as any other form of advice, and I think that while it's helpful to have those lists provided in mage books and other role-playing game books, they kind of have to be taken with a grain of salt. It helps to know where the authors were coming from when they crafted the setting, but you have to understand that if you go and read those books to kind of get deeper knowledge about it, you may not get the same kind of stuff out of them, out of those source materials that they did. Okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. It does make sense that you can go back and read some book that the author raved about and say, okay, this is how he sees it, when actually if you interviewed the author, he would say, well, I liked this part, but I really didn't like this other part. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, our book today is Kid Eternity, written by Grant Morrison with art by Duncan Figredo. It's a graphic novel, or as people in the know say, a comic book marketed to adults. It is complete in one book. The pages aren't numbered, but it isn't very thick. It was put out by DC Comics in 1991 in three issues. How often is this recommended in mage books? Only once. The reading list is in uh, the reading list in the first edition rule book says various comics in this new imprint of DC Comics are incredibly useful for mage. For pure mageliness, you can't beat this one. End quote. Stuart Wick, the man who created Mage, recommends this one. The other mage writers don't mention it. The character Kid Eternity started in Hit Comics number 25 in December 1942. A DC Comics fan site gives a synopsis of the first Kid Eternity, and I share it because I read it before reading today's book, and it really helped me. A boy and his grandfather are killed in a U-boat, that's submarine, attack on a civilian steamship, but when the lad reaches the pearly gates, his name is not on the list. So Mr. Keeper, who was responsible for this clerical error, brings back the boy's spirit into his body, and the lad lives again and is endowed with great powers, including invisibility and intangibility. But most important, by speaking the word eternity, the boy could call upon any person in mythology or history to aid him in any given situation. In the spring of 1946, Kid Eternity got his own comic book. It ran for 18 issues. Quality Comics sold its intellectual property to DC Comics in 1956. In the early 80s, he was made a character in Captain Marvel's comic. Uh, DC's Captain Marvel is called Shazam today. That was the second incarnation. The book we're discussing today is the third Kid Eternity. The book is about a stand-up comic in New York City named Jerry, who sees Kid Eternity appear suddenly in an upscale party. Strange forces attack, and after the comic flees, Kid Eternity appears to him again. Jerry agrees to help Kid Eternity journey to hell to free his friend, the Keeper. In the process, they find the Lords of Chaos tricked Kid Eternity into helping them in the past, but this time they give the whole story. They need Kid Eternity and Jerry to dodge attackers, make it to New York, and establish a chaos sphere to continue human evolution. This will improve humanity's lot and free the Lords of Chaos to return to a higher existence. Their bacon is saved at the last moment by Jack the Ripper, proving sometimes a dangerous killer on the loose is just what you need, apparently. Uh, Puka, do you have any thoughts on the book you'd like to share? I will say I was excited to read it because I like Grand Morrison overall. Their run on X-Men is what brought me back to reading that comic more regularly, and their later work from the 90s, The Invisibles, is one of my favorite series. So my expectations were maybe inflated. This book does not read smoothly, I think is probably the most diplomatic way I can say that. But I, I didn't hate it. I probably would have found it a lot more impressive in terms of the risks it took if I'd read it back in 1991 when it came out. And I can understand why Mage First Edition writers kind of turned to it. I actually didn't realize it was on that specific reading list, so that's good to know. But it just seemed to me like it really wanted to do too much too quickly. And in the balance, I don't know that it came across exactly as the author intended, but I do think there are useful tidbits to pull out that make it 
helpful for discussions about mage and for, like I said before, conceptualizing some of the wigglier bits of the setting. Yeah, I'm not a comics expert, but I did read a few. Marvel and DC Comics both had their magic characters. Uh, Marvel portrayed theirs basically the same as superheroes. DC Comics allowed their magic characters to be more mysterious and mystical, leading to some great stories over the years. A little research into the origin of Kid Eternity helped me a lot. The story started in the middle of several tense scenes and shuttled back and forth. I was confused, but I would have been lost without some prior knowledge. The chapters are called Contos, so I thought of the Divine Comedy. That's another story where the main character travels through hell and then uh, leaves again to return home. Then Kin Eternity takes a copy of the Divine Comedy off the shelf in one scene and talks about it. I was thinking, I saw the connection before this. No one is going to believe me now. On the cover and throughout the book, we see the Kid Eternity icon. It, contain, it looks like a sun with eight rays, but it actually represents a chaos sphere which is the mystic engine that starts up at the end of the story. This chaos symbol looks a lot like the chaos symbol from Michael Moorcock's Elric stories, which is featured prominently in Games Workshop's Warhammer Miniatures games. Uh, a likable or relatable character in a story increases the appeal for most people. Jerry wasn't a bad guy, but he wasn't really likable either, at least for me. He mostly tags along through the story and complains. Kid Eternity is kind of a jerk. I mean, you know, gotta be honest, at least from my point of view. He's rude to Jerry when Jerry goes through difficult experiences. He breaks his promise to the owner of the Maps of Hell without caring. And when he discovers he accidentally left a serial killer on the loose for years, he doesn't really mind. He's not the kind of guy I want to hang out with. The book repeatedly states heaven and hell are the same place. It's just a matter of perspective. I can see this having shock value and sounding cool, but it doesn't hold together very well. Heaven is a place of happiness. Hell used to be a place of punishing evil. Now it's a place of suffering. Telling me happiness and suffering are the same thing, depending on how I look at it, doesn't work so well. Uh, yes, there are some things that are pleasant for some people, but awful for others, but we're talking about extremes. The book shows us the horrible suffering of souls in hell. We see souls trying to escape. We don't see anyone enjoying the place. The twist ending where Jerry is saved at the last moment by a summoned Jack the Ripper is supposed to be funny, but I couldn't laugh. It seemed too callous to me. Throughout the book, Jack the Ripper was killing innocent people. I don't think it balances out. Those are my notes I took while reading. I want to shift now to the questions I prepare for Puka and myself. Uh, Puka, what did you like about this book? So I'll admit that whenever I'm reading graphic novels or comics, one of the first things I look to is the art and layout, especially when it breaks with convention and does interesting things. And while I don't know that the, let's say, frenetic style of this text did it any favors, I found it engaging and I did like the style. And I like finding little details and kind of interesting angles and visually arresting moments. So that was cool. The color palettes are just gorgeous as well. And that is important to me. With the setting of it, it's funny, while I was reading this, I was thinking about, I feel like I've seen hell or its analogs represented so many times in comics. Like comic authors just love to seeing they seem to love going back to hell over and over. So in Sandman and Lucifer, etc. But I like this take on it because it's more of a chaos mishmash than anything else. And that's borne out in everything from the relentlessly cluttered artwork to the assortment of spaces and entities, the protagonists encounter as they travel through it. I do think that a hellscape or whatever you want to call it should be represented as this confusing and disconcerting place, even if some of the sort of Abrahamic elements are retained, as they are in this instance, although only in passing. And there's something to be said for demons who think and act like historical figures popping up. In addition to Jack the Ripper, at one point, we get a cameo from Walt Whitman, and Kid Eternity's like, wait, why did I summon him? I think overall I'd call it kind of an absurdist meta-commentary on the grim, dark fantasy that permeated comics of the time. And I'm here for that. When it comes to the plot and characters, I'm going to try and be positive about the plot. <laughs> I, I like nonlinear storytelling. I like characters whose journeys take unexpected turns and disparate threads being introduced that seem unrelated only to be brought together in a package at the end. I think it can be interesting. And like I said, I think the book tried to do all of that in a small space, and sometimes it comes together. In terms of characters, I liked Kid Eternity's powers, but weirdly, my favorite was this very minor side character named Val Hoffman, who's a mostly unimportant and slightly problematic in the end character. She's writing a book about creepy urban myths, and then 
maybe because of that chaotic eruption in the upscale party in the opening scenes, she seems to be cursed to see these urban myths everywhere. And I'd love to find a way to translate that into like a character flaw in Mage. Maybe not quite Echoes, but something else. I'm sure there's something in M20 that covers it. I just can't think of it. In this book, I like the creativity, the supernatural elements invading the regular world and then retreating again. The Shichiriran is such a cool-sounding name, and their powers were brilliant. They can only manifest on Earth by inhabiting inanimate objects and animating them. The images in a Picasso painting move off the canvas and cut people with their two-dimensional edges. A statue comes to life and bludgeons someone. An elevator car collapses on the occupants as soon as the doors close. These are not only cool scenes there, but there's, there's symbolism a storyteller uh, could play with during games. You could have a class of umbrud that the players need to understand to oppose. Uh, too often I see mage writers portraying the games as mages fighting other mages. The notion of a large supernatural world of first edition is really here for us to see. Uh, let's move on to the second question. Puka, what did you dislike about this book? I mean, basically in all of the same categories I listed above, there was some kind of thing I had an issue with. The book is so bombastic that it doesn't do itself any favors in that it overreaches in almost every way. And part of that is it is a miniseries. It was only three issues, and it uses up a lot of its space-creating mood, which is fine. But if you only have so much space to work with, there's a balance between mood and plot that needs to be struck, and I don't think this book hit it. The mood is expansive and excellent and complex. The plot is either disjointed to the point of confusing or or condensed into heavy stretches of exposition with lots of loose ends. With the characters, Jack the Ripper, like you said, I found it, it, it kind of fell flat. I, I did get that sense also that his appearance was supposed to be, if not amusing, then at least kind of cheeky, and it just didn't come across that way at all. A lot of the characters didn't have much depth to them. Even Jerry and Kid Eternity both felt pretty one-dimensional to me. Overall, they felt like they were only there to be either pushed forward by forces they have little to no control over or resistance to, or they're just bodies to be present when Morrison is presenting the ideas that are infused into the story. And with those ideas, so Invisibles came out after this and after first edition Mage, I suspect that if it had come out before, that would have been the text that they pointed to. Kid Eternity feels like a rough draft for that series. And yet it also kind of feels like a knockoff of Sandman because everybody was trying to knock off Sandman back then. <laughs> and there are references to things like the turning of the Aeon and the alignments of coincidence and things like that, but they're just kind of mentioned without explanation of why they matter. So I would rather have more time to explore those ideas and their impact on the characters rather than just, boom, here's one, boom, here's another. Oh no, here's Jack the Ripper, the story's over. Yeah, I had a hard time with the, the nihilism. That outlook is always difficult for me, and it shows up in force at the end of the story. Eternity is a word central to this book, and at the end, Kid Eternity says the word means nothing. It's just sounds. I had trouble with Kid Eternity after discovering the Lords of Chaos lied to him and manipulated him for years, decides to trust them. If someone proved to be like that, I wouldn't agree to work with them again, no matter what story they present this time. The Lords of Chaos aren't really chaotic. They look ugly and strange when they appear, but they're working to raise humanity to a higher state and get themselves to a higher state of being. Not very chaotic. They make long-term plans and stick to them, also not very chaotic. The Lords of Order are likewise not very orderly. They appear as geometric solids, but besides that, all they want to do is keep themselves on top of Hell's hierarchy. They send their minions to kill people, destroy stuff, and they don't worry about the consequences. Order and chaos are kind of meaningless words in the story, just like eternity. Uh, the lords of chaos want to advance evolution by means of mystic engines that increase chaos, but evolution is, is not change or randomness. Evolution is either changes to a group of organisms to help them survive in a given environment, or changes that bring improvements. Increasing randomness and expecting evolution to result is so unlikely, it it just didn't work for me. It's like flooding a city with radiation and saying the children born in the next few years will be superior. The thing I dislike the most in the story is the ugliness. A baby is murdered in a crib, the child molesting ship captain, a kid gets beaten to death with a metal bar. These things don't advance the plot. They're just ugly. At one point, a lord of chaos says the ship captain was destined for hell because of his sins, but heaven and hell are the same place in the story. Everyone who dies is going there. It's a boneheaded point to make. Uh, our next question is uh, about 
ideas for mage, what, what ideas this might suggest. Puka, did any occur to you? So generally speaking, I don't run games with infernal or nefandic antagonists, but I think that there are a few interesting ideas for those that could be extracted from this text. <laughs> Alternatively, I think it provides a template for interesting kinds of umbrood, like the Shichiron who you mentioned, uh, but also umbrood who are called demons because they're amoral in the small scale and that they don't really care about people's physical or emotional well-being that much uh, in service of their grand machinations. But they're not necessarily malevolent in, in the grand scheme of things. They're not benevolent either, but they <laughs> they kind of defy being understood in those terms. Whether or not that point comes across solidly enough in this text is a separate question. But I enjoy when Mage lives in those kind of weird in-between spaces and the unsettling things one finds in there, so I like that. From a much more immediate story construction point of view, the disjointed nature of time on the threshold of death as a trope I like that for something like a euthanatos seeking. And then calling up demons or spirits in the form of historical figures could be a fun rote for a hermetic or someone to have in their pocket. There, it wasn't exactly always clear to me what the chaos spheres were supposed to be, whether it was something in mage terms akin to a reality zone or local consensus or something, or the nature of the engines of chaos that they refer to. I suppose it's some kind of metaphysical system rather than a physical object. Uh, but I'm intrigued by the idea that these are things that are actually for the benefit of humanity. It's just that mages are the only ones who can see how. So if we think of Kid Eternity as a mage, and he has these allies, and they're heroically fighting to reconstruct these engines or chaos spheres, despite the name, that kind of uncertainty and morally dubious characters playing a game that ordinary minds can't even perceive, that's something that I think can work for mage. And mages can warp reality, but they're still fundamentally coming at it from a human perspective. Morrison is maybe one of the few comics writers who can probably approximate the deep psychology of an alien perspective and having the conflict between the two, you know, I, I would do that in Mage. That's the only World of Darkness game where I think you can actually get away with that. Yeah. It inspired me to create new classes or groups of umbrood and supernatural creatures for my games. I always like interesting reasons to pull sleepers into a story and make them necessary. Jerry appears to be tagging along for no reason at points, but he has a pivotal role. I like the examples of sleepers misunderstanding supernatural events. That helps me as a storyteller. Uh, next question, Puka, did you get any insights into Mage? I was going to say not really, but I think I'm going to piggyback off of what you just said, actually. It doesn't give me much to work with for figuring out things like Paradigm or Avatar. It maybe gives a little bit to latch onto in terms of Umbra stuff, but that's more trying to shoehorn this text into Mage rather than seeing what comes out of it more organically. But the two specific pieces that I think could work well or could illuminate the world of Mage more for somebody. First, it illustrates pretty clearly that the technocracy and the traditions are not the only ones fighting a war for reality in the game. I don't think we get enough solid information to characterize the characters here as Nefandi or Marauders, but maybe something in between. They're definitely not technocrats, though. And then second, it demonstrates how utterly terrifyingly bonkers it is for sleepers to find themselves in this world. So yeah, if Jerry is an ordinary sleeper, at least at first blush, this text really shows how arrogant and uncaring and goal-oriented mages are at the expenses of non-mages. And even though, slight spoiler, Jerry arguably goes through a kind of awakening at the end, it's a deeply traumatic process for him. And he's the ordinary human who comes out in the strongest position, arguably. So it's a reminder that mages are monsters. Like in any other World of Darkness game, the protagonists are not nice. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the early uh, early editions of Mage did have more of a sense of mages seeking out sleepers and not awakening them, but letting them know that supernatural things are going on and saying, hey, why don't you be my employee or, or helper or sidekick or, or something along those lines. And m later Mage books had less emphasis on that. And so uh, that was one thing I kind of noticed while reading this book. It's like, oh, yeah, the uh, the acolytes and, and so on. The, the first edition of Mage really talked about that. Later editions, not so much. 
The notion of too much stasis being remedied by more dynamism was important to Stuart Wick, but I saw it only in terms of human society. I was forgetting mage plays with supernatural themes and the idea of a mysterious universe. This helped me revisit stasis versus dynamism with a cosmic or supernatural perspective, and I really appreciated that. Next question, Puka, did you get any ideas for something new to try while running mage? So I know that conceptually my tolerance for this kind of madcap structure is higher than a lot of folks I've gamed with. So when I come across something that even I have a hard time figuring out, it makes me stop and go, oh, so this is what it feels like, you know, when I try to incorporate this kind of stuff into a game. And the nonlinear narratives, the sort of fever dream umbrascapes or reality zones, magic that bleeds outside of the sphere system, I love bringing in stuff like that. But it's good once in a while to be reminded by an inspirational text or what might be an inspirational text, how those techniques kind of push against the boundaries of storytelling to the point that you really need a strong foundation underneath. In the same way that I wouldn't give this to someone as their first graphic novel ever to read, I wouldn't do a mage game that incorporates similar storytelling strategies for a novice player. So that was kind of useful to, to see that from the other side. That being said, for a veteran player who's doing a newly awakened character, I think it provides the kind of fragmented and nightmarish setting that really drives home Mage as a horror game. Having a fish-out-of-water protagonist discovering this new supernatural world is a trope that I suspect comes up in a lot of games, but it's rarely inflected with quite as much pandemonium. So I would like to give that a try. I think the game that I ran during lockdown, I had a lot of veteran players and one or two new mage players, but veteran World of Darkness players, and they're all fans of Morrison and that kind of work. So this this kind of structure and the ideas in here are something that I could see myself constructing a game for that group around. Yeah, this book made me want to put more scenes in the wee hours of the morning to mix exhaustion and empty streets into a surreal scene. It gives me a boldness to let supernatural things invade sleeper gatherings. People will explain the things away or doubt their senses. I think too often we make the mages and monsters uh, terrified of being seen. We forget the sabbat are a part of the vampire, uh, the masquerade game. They tear up cities, terrify whole neighborhoods, and don't sweat the details. It's part of what makes them so scary. Final question, Puka, does this book belong on the list of books recommended for mage ultimately i'd say probably not although it may have once belonged there i can read it and make it work and i don't regret reading it but almost across the board i think there are better options if you want a visual representation of a hell dimension or something close to it it's not bad but if you want chaos magic as an important factor you're better off with the invisibles if you want trippy afterlife temporal mishmash stuff Certain volumes of the series Kabuki have that with similarly impressive art. If you want idiosyncratic magic and morally gray demons and historical ghosts and everyday weirdness, you're better off with Sandman or Lucifer. And Sandman even benefits from being written in the same time period. And that's just comics and graphic novels. That's not even getting into other forms of writing. So again, I think it's partially the function of limited space and overreach. And I do think this fits better with Mage than other World of Darkness games, even something like Demon. But unless you have a desire to explore this niche of literature as thoroughly as possible, I don't think it's necessary to read it. And I would probably pick other things ahead of it. I think the notion of change being needed and resisted by strong supernatural forces makes this fit uh, well with Stuart Wick's vision of Mage. It made this abstract idea more concrete for me. Stuart's vision of Mage was stasis versus dynamism, not order versus chaos, but there is enough overlap to, to get me thinking, so I appreciated that. Well, folks, that's our discussion on Kid Eternity. If anything didn't make sense, consider yourself fortunate. It means you haven't crossed over to our point of view yet, but there's still hope for you. I'm planning another episode. When will that be? My schedule book is a handful of tea leaves. I'll consult it later. We'll be discussing John Constantine Hellblazer, another comic book, because they have more pictures. Until then, tell your friends about the show, Reality Deviance Book Club. Come for the discussion. Stay for the unhinged rants. Although they'd never admit to it, this episode has been a part of Mage the Podcast. If you would like to let us know what you think, send an email, magethepodcast at gmail.com. You can subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn and other aggregators. If you like the show and don't worry about what others think, you can leave a review online. Those reviews help other people find the show in their searches. And as less reputable places say, there's always room for one more. You can follow us on Twitter at Mage the Podcast. 
We are on the web at magethepodcast.com. We're on YouTube. There's a link in the show notes, but just search for Mage the Podcast and you'll find us there. If you would like to become an executive producer for this podcast, a link in the show notes will help you do that. No one would blame you for Reality Deviance Book Club. Thanks everyone for listening. Until next time, truth until paradox, baby.